This is the, the uh, third of our four talks, and today we're going to get on to discussing religion, except we're not actually going to discuss religion, we're going to discuss theism, which is the basic idea about what underlies um, religion in, in the sense of who God is, or what God is, and how it's related, how God is related to the world. And I'm going to explain in, as we get on about what theism is. And this is the, the third of the four, as I said, explaining theism is the title. So next week, I will discuss various applications. At the end, my last slide today is a list of things that I could talk about next week. But if you have any other things you'd like me to talk about, why don't you mention it at the end? Because I haven't got, I've only partly done next week. And as usual, we talk with a break in the middle. And so the, the, what I wanted to cover today are some of the things about theism. And I'm going to begin by looking at the principles of theism, what exists, and we, those were briefly discussed in the first lecture, but I'll revise them again so we can see what they are. And then there'll be some what I call arguments, various short things you can prove from these principles that I've explained. And the, I want to go through these because many people have ideas about religion and theism which are contradicted by these arguments. So I want to sort of provide a, an, a skeleton to the thoughts that I'm going to be presenting later, something rigid which keeps things in shape. Um, so there's argument from being, the argument from life itself, because God is being itself and life itself. And then we get on to the interesting part of the talk, which is um, how we are images of God. And so we have to understand exactly how that might work. And I'm going to say images of God in every part, and that's where it gets particularly interesting, because when we look at each part, we can see images of God in the part as well as in the whole. And then we can learn a lot. We can come to some specific ideas about what creation is like and to be an image like that. And in particular, I'm going to show that there are levels in creation and sub-levels and sub-sub-levels. Uh, the Swedenborgian, Swedenborg normally calls these discrete degrees. So I'm going to explain about the possibility of sub-degrees, sub-sub-degrees, etc. And we can see, we'll see that the, quite a lot of detailed predictions follow from these principles of theism that we have here. And then at the end, I will look at questions of correspondences, what Swedenborg calls correspondences. I'm going to discuss the question of personal identity, how you identify a person over their lifetime, no matter how long it might be. And then there's the question of law and intervention, because some people think that natural law prevents anything from intervening or involving themselves from the outside. So we have to discuss exactly how we formulate natural law. And so here's a couple of slides in which I revise what I said in the first lecture as a preview. I'm going to start from the principle that God is a person who is these list of things here, necessary being, unselfish love and wisdom, and therefore life itself. Each of those things is not so much part of, as I said earlier, a standard philosophical theism, but I think it's part of most people's idea of, of, in religion to have an idea of God as having these properties. And you can, in the first lecture I showed how you can justify each of these properties from your preferred holy scripture, so to speak. And the result of it is that God enlivens the world. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that God creates the world and lets it run by itself, but God creates the world and then continues to keep it going by providing it with life. That's what I mean by enliven. And I can now go into these principles in a little bit more detail to spell out more clearly. And I... I left out the important one, so I put a zero, a principle zero here, which is that God exists and God is one. Okay, this is the, the principle which is the very beginning of, of a religious understanding. You have to believe that. And that God is one is one of the principles of the monotheisms. So I'm, I'm, I'm addressing religion or the basis of religion from the point of view of Judaic or Christian or Islamic monotheism. Then I said God is love, and now I want to say love which is unselfish and cannot love itself. Uh, 
I've got, as first, as furthermore, it cannot love only itself. That's not such a strong proposition, but it's all we need here. But I actually believe that from, from Swedenborg that God cannot love himself at all. And now, a number of Christians disagree with that, um, and so there's some discussion we could come back to later. The second principle, on was the third one on the list, is God is wisdom, uh, as well as love. And furthermore, we normally think that our understanding or our illumination or our wisdom comes when we receive it from God. And I, want to, I'll, I won't have so much time to explain this aspect, but I, may, I might discuss it next week in a bit more detail. So God is wisdom as well as love. And once you have love and wisdom together, then you have the, the capacity for action, for wise action. Love wants to produce the action, and wisdom just shows how to produce the action. So then you have the power and the action that follows from that. Now, if we summarize all of those things together, we say that God is life itself. And I will discuss later on what exactly life itself is, but I'm going to summarize, I'll say it here, it's the source of all dispositions to will, think, and act. So every love, every understanding, every action we have comes originally from God. And so the challenge is to understand that, how that works, because if we look at ourselves, it doesn't appear that all our life and wisdom and understanding comes from God, but the theism is an explanation, a deeper explanation of what the fundamental causes are. And then we end with everything in the world as a kind of image of God. In other words, I'm, and, I'm, and I said earlier, an, an image of God when, as, a, as us as a whole and all of our parts. So that means all our minds, all our natural objects of all kinds, each of these are images of God. But they're not all images of God in the same way, so we have to discuss that. And then finally, our life derives from divine power. This is, so God is life itself, but he is the source of life for everything in the universe. Every animate or inanimate, every conscious, unconscious thing in the universe has life or power that comes from God in some way. And as I said, this, these, this list was suggested by Emanuel Swedenborg in this book, Divine Love and Wisdom. So my talks can be regarded as a preliminary discussion in order to begin to understand this book of divine love and wisdom. So now we come to some simple arguments and where you can use the principles that we have so far. And the first one is that God is being itself. We want to, what, we want to understand what that means. Now it's clear that we exist People exist, we exist, created beings exist. And another way of saying that we exist is that we have being. We, uh, our being exists. But God is being itself. So that, therefore, that implies some relation between our being and, God, and the being of God. And so if God is being itself, what, what I take that to mean is that our being either is God or depends on God. That's what we mean by, if God is being itself and we have being, it means that our being comes from God, either that, logically speaking, either we are God already, or our being comes from God. And the fact that our being comes from God is the basic principle of theism. It distinguishes theism from, mono, from deism and non-dualism and other monistic views. In theism, God is the source of, of us. But this, this here says that we either we are God or depends on God. It doesn't distinguish, the logic doesn't as yet distinguish between us being God or depending on God. In order to do that, we have to have another argument, which is based on the fact that God is unselfish love. God, God is love which is unselfish. And as I said, well, as I said, I believe unselfish love cannot, an unselfish love cannot love itself. That means that we must be distinct from God. Because if we were not distinct from God, then we'd be the same as God, and therefore God would be loving himself when he loved us. So the simple fact of God's love being unselfish tells us that God is not us. That is, we are separate from God in some way. So this basic fact can be used... To, for discussion with, say, the non-dualists, which you may have met from a variety of um, re religious ideas. 
or spiritual ideas that we are all part of the whole. God is everything that is. But if, this, if, if God is unselfish love, then you can argue that we must be in, se in some way separate from God. And if you talk to these people, most of them will admit that God is unselfish love because they don't want to say God is selfish love. And so therefore, there's a way of discussing with them about um, whether we're the same as God or not. And so that means we don't have pantheism. Um, pantheism is one of the, the versions or the relatives of theism. Pantheism is when everything is a part of God. Now, the non-dualists often say that it, we are really part of God, but, it, but it's an illusion that we think we're separate from God. This is one way that the non-dualists address the, the, you know, the fact that we don't appear to be part of God. But this argument about unselfish love is an argument from how things appear from the side of God, not from the side of us. In the sight of God, we must be separate from God. And God presumably sees things how we are, and therefore it can't be an illusion that we're separate from God because God doesn't have illusions. So if you're going to use the illusion argument, if the non-dualists are going to use the illusion argument, then it has to be an illusion from God's point of view, which is a very strange way of doing it. Another argument that we can use is that God cannot create another God because some people think when they look at the world and they see all the flaws in the, in the way the creation is made, and they say, why couldn't God just create many gods and everyone will be happy, they will be perfect and they'll all be completely lovable, they do all the right thing. Why doesn't God just create lots of little gods and we're maybe those little gods? But in fact, the arguments, the principles that we've started with so far don't allow there to be another God. You might have, you might have some idea from the fact that God is one, but maybe the one God is split into many pieces. That's how you could have little gods. But in fact, let us suppose that God did create something that, had, that lived in itself. In other words, it was a self-sufficient being that went about its daily life and didn't depend on the original God in any way. Then this, this being that was autonomous and self-sufficient would have as one of its attributes life itself. It would have life in itself because it wouldn't depend on God. So... But life itself is one of the attributes of God, one of the ways of describing God. And if life itself is God, that means that this independent being, which we thought we was independent from God, had what, had what actually was God because it had life in itself and life in itself was God. And then, since God is one, we conclude that that thing wouldn't be distinct from God. In other words, life itself is God and everything that lives must be either dependent on God or be God. It's the same argument as with being. All these itselfs that we had, life itself, love itself, wisdom itself, all of these mean that things that have being, life, love, or wisdom, either they are God or they are de dependent on God. And if they're dependent on God, they're not equal to God. They're separate. So all of these arguments about starting from the idea of God that we have here, we can show the basic structure of theism, that God is the source of life, love, and wisdom, and we are separate from the source, but we depend on the source in some way. So the question is, how we depend on the source? We'll come to that. And so that means all these arguments are proving in, from the starting points that we have that we do exist distinct from God. And, and you can just take it from a rather simple point of view. If God loves us unselfishly, we must be distinct from God because if we weren't, it, it wouldn't be self, unselfish love. And this comes back to the prospect of creating little gods again. God cannot create beings who live in themselves. See, Plato, the Greek philosopher, thought that souls 
had life in themselves. This was his idea of the soul of everybody. But we see from these arguments that in the theistic framework, Plato's soul would actually, those souls would actually be God, because God is life itself, and if you have life itself, you have God in you. And so we conclude by saying that little gods cannot be created. So all of these arguments show a sort of reinforcing the idea of theism, showing the, the relation between God and us. There's a, there's a dependence, but a separation at the same time. And so our challenge is to understand that in more detail. Many times I've mentioned life itself. And I said I was going to, I've, I've mentioned one definition earlier on, but I'm now going to be more specific. Life itself is the most original generative disposition, this is using the ideas from last week, that gives rise to its capacities and actions. In other words, it's the original source of, of, of life. And God is life itself. In other words, the original source of all powers and capacities and dispositions. So life is being used in a general way. It's not just referring to human life or to animal life, but it refers to the life of inanimate matter because inanimate matter has capacities for action. So every capacity or power to do anything, um, the ability of an electron to repel another electron is one of its capacities for action, and all of these powers and capacities derive from God in some way. And so the challenge, again, is to understand how. And so, how do we live? Our being in life depends on God. Now, our being in life depends on God, but then there's the question of what in our life is actually our own. Because if everything depends on God, are we practically God? But I'm going to say that our actions are our own. We, we are free. We want to choose when to act. And we'll, which will come to that. So I'm going to say that the final, the, the, if God is at the top and all the actions, all the powers in between, and then as a result, we have events or actions in the physical world. These actions, I'm going to say, are what, what are distinctive and unique to us. Our, our, you can call it our book of life or the history of ourselves the, it's, is, is, the, uh, is, is the set of all these actions. And... The question is how we receive the life from God in relation to the actions that we've taken in the past. And I'm going to have this general principle, which I'm going to explain in a little bit, but I want to say the general principle is that the life we have is derived from God in accordance with what we've already done. So we receive life from God in a way which depends on what we've already done. And I'll explain why the life, why God should act in this manner. Because this is sort of the, the principle of operation of God with respect to the universe. And it may seem obvious, but the clearest explanation was from Swedenborg, and many people don't fully agree with, with this way. They think that God has completely arbitrary power to make us, or to remake us, or to destroy us and recreate us all at once. But if you do that, then there's no history, and, and this doesn't really work very well. But the reason that God gives us power in accordance with what we've already done is that so that we can choose, we can choose when to act. So I'll, I'll discuss this in more detail. But the, the purpose of it is that we want to enjoy our actions. If we do something that's nice, even just having a drink, it feels nice, we want the feeling of delight to correspond at the same time as our action or just after, in, in, in direct relation. So in other words, it appears that, to us that when we do something and, and feel the delight, that it's our own delight. Because you can imagine a dictator of, of the universe forcing everyone to do things, and, and if the delight was delayed or is at a different time from the action, then people wouldn't like to act. They wouldn't feel as though that was themselves acting. They wouldn't feel free. They'd feel compelled to act, and then the, the, the delight might come later. 
And it, it's very important to God that we enjoy our actions. This is one of the fact, it comes from the fact that his love of us is unselfish. So he wants us to enjoy things the same way that he enjoyed them, but we want, he wants us to feel our enjoyment. He wants us to appropriate to ourselves the enjoyment of our actions. And this means that the delight, the powers that come from God, must be connected to our actions. They must be at the same time as the actions, or clearly in relation to our actions. And now I'm going to explain what this means in terms of the ideas from last week. We're going to say that our actions... Our actions are the occasional cause, and God's life is the principal cause. The principal cause is the, the power that produces the effect, and the occasional cause are the circumstances that are the necessary conditions for the principal cause to operate. So you remember last week when I talked about the con something being a, a selection and a generation? So um, God's life is the, generates all our action, but... Our actions are the selections of what life has produced. And if, and if the world is organized like this, then our actions are the occasional cause. It appears to us is that our actions give rise to feelings and thoughts. We, we see things in the world. We have an idea which comes from that. It appears to us as though our life follows immediately from our actions. But in fact, our actions are only the occasional cause. They're only the occasion for God to act. And this is the simplest way of seeing the relation between God and the life of the world uh, in theism. It's actually a bit more complicated than that, as you might guess. But this is the simplest way. This is the simplest view uh, that I talked about last week, the two-level view of God and action. There's this occasionalism of Malibranch. But this... The, there are things in between, but these two facts are the basis of, I claim, of, of seeing how theism works in the world. Now, you remember I said God was love itself and then wisdom itself, and these were the two principles. And then I said on the basis of that, God is power and action. So there's, there's like a little trinity there but it's a trinity within God, okay? It's, it's not a trinity of gods, but it's a trinity within one person. We can think of a picture of a person. It's, we can think of Christ as a person in which there is this trinity, but in fact it applies not just to Jesus as he was living on earth. It applies to God before he created anything. This, he had this trinity there. And you can interpret that in various ways in different religions. But the way I want to interpret it here is that love is the power or the substance of God, wisdom is the form or the shape or the understanding of God, and action is the resulting act that follows from God. And so this threefold structure of God, a trinity within God, is, is very important because we are going to be images of God in the, in the same way. And now, for the, my next slides, I'm, I'm going to show some complicated pictures, so why don't you pass, take one and pass it along. I'm going to start with images of God, so we'll wait until you... Just take one sheet and then pass the remaining ones on. I'll, I'll take some and pass it to the back here. Okay, so if you find the, the first one there, slide, I think I've numbered them correctly, slide 13, is images of God. And I've, I've now, on the sheet, I've put down the four next transparencies because, as you can see, there's, there are tables there that get a little bit complicated. I'm going to walk you through these tables when we get to them. So let's coming back to the first one, images of God. And... I'm going to explain the general principles of how I understand the world to be images of God. All the world and all its parts 
is a kind of image of God. And furthermore, we are images to a greater or lesser extent because some people take the fact that humans are in the image of God as presented in the Bible only to refer to some aspect of human beings. And, and that certainly there's a sense in which that is true. But I want to generalize it and say there's another sense in which it is true of all animals, all plants, all minerals, all atoms. They're all in some way an image of God. Because if you just look at humans and animals, there's an enormous similarity between the internal structures of humans and of animals. We believe animals have feelings and thoughts, perceptions and desires. All of these things follow. They may not have the rationality that we think humans have or, or ought to have, but I still think everything in the world is an image of God. And then I'm going to state this sentence here, which is, doesn't quite make sense yet, but I'm going to say that Love and wisdom and action in God are unified and continuous, but we'll see that in us they're spread out into, into separate parts, and I'll explain what those parts are. But the important thing is that there, are, there is in us images of God of love, wisdom, and action. So that's the thing to remember. Everything, us as a, as a whole, and us in every part has Three, has a threefold image in it, okay? So, we have the idea of hands. This is the original idea of hands. Now, earlier on, I said that we have to be able to choose when to act, okay? We, we, this is the, an important way in which God gives us life so that we can choose when to act, and then the delight of action follows from that action when we choose. You must all know that if you've been asked to do something, it's much more pleasurable if you choose when you do it, rather than rely on, follow it immediately when someone else tells you to do it. A measure of a job's autonomy or seniority is when you can choose what actions to do and not just be told all the time exactly what to do at each stage. It's a general feature of human life that Freedom follows from the sense of being able to choose what to do. And the reason for this is to enjoy our actions. But that means that if we are to receive life from God and act when we want, then we have to receive life from God and keep it for a while and then use it when we want to. This is, this is, the life we receive from God is not used immediately. It has to be taken in to us, ourselves in some way. It has to be stored at least for a, a little while, and then we, the life is going to be used when we think we want to use it. It's like food, you know. We're not just, we don't only do things at the same time as we're eating. We, we ingest food, we store the energy from food, and then we act as a result of that energy. But we receive something like love and something like wisdom and something like action or power from God. And this means that there has to be separate containers, in some sense, separate containers for love, wisdom, and the means to action. So we receive life from God. That life is not us. We are always the recipients of life. This is the sort of the, something in a cup. This is the image, or blood in our vessels. That is an image of the way God's life lives within us. So we receive life, but we have to be able to store it and then use it. And the point is that these are then combined when we choose. And so we have to see what in us is the reception of love, what in us is the reception of wisdom, and what in us is the reception of means to action, and see if we can understand what those are from what we know already. And cooking... Ingredients for cooking is a, an image of how this might work. We have three ingredients. We receive love, wisdom, and means to action, and we receive these ingredients, and then they act when we decide to act. And this reception in, in Swedenborg is also called influx. So influx of, of life or love, wisdom, power into us, and then we receive it. Influx is from the source, and we, it's reception on our point of view.
But I said there are three kinds of things we receive from love, receive from God, because everything receives something like love, something like wisdom, and something like power to action. So therefore, there's three kinds of reception. There's three parts of us that receive things. Now I'm going to say what, what I think these are. You'll probably recognize some of these, but I'm trying them in a framework which you may recognize. The first thing, as I call the spiritual, the, the, spiritual nat- the spiritual body or the spiritual being of us is like a receptacle that receives loves in creation. Our desires, loves, affections, motivations, purposes, all of these things belong to love. And so there has to be something in us in our body, mind, or soul, something there which receives sp- spiritual things. So, as I said, power, anything that's a desire or love is, a, is, a, is an object, it's a substance which, be, which is in a certain form. That's as we talked in the second lecture. So there's the spiritual things which have to be received. There's the mental things which have to be received the separate carriers of wisdom, including thoughts, ideas, understanding, rationality, plans, ideologies, beliefs. All of these things are mental, and they're all part of wisdom. If we are to be wise, we have to understand about rationality and how to understand things. We have to know what ideas are and be able to think with ideas, see other people's ideas. All of these things are are parts of, of mental. I call them mental. And then finally we receive the third thing from God, which is the power to action. And I call it the physical. To deal with the separate final actions and effects. And I say all the things we know from physics, all electric charges, magnetic charges, field theory, gravity, all of these things are physical things and we have to receive something in us, namely our physical body, receives these things in, in some way. Now, I'll just mention at the end here that the first two, the spiritual and the mental, are both mind in some ways. Okay, so I'm, I'm twisting, I'm bending the terminology a little bit because normally we think of the spiritual as in the mind. But I'm, I'm going to use the spirit, mind, and body to refer to those three things. But I'm just saying there's another use of the word mind which refers to the first two together. So, there are, th- there are three things in us. There's a spiritual thing which receives loves. There's a mental thing which receives understanding and ideas. And there's a physical thing which receives physical powers to act. And these have to be related together. And, and the way I'm going to relate them together is to use the ideas from last week when I talked about generative levels. You remember, a a level above generates the one below, and the one below selects what is is generated. And so God is a God, and then the spiritual, and then the mental, and then the physical are four generative levels with three stages of, of generation between them. So God produces the spiritual and the spiritual produces the mental, and the mental produces the physical. Um, and so I can... God generates the, the first spiritual realms where the containing substances, where there are containing substances which appropriate and retain love, number one. The spiritual acts by producing new thoughts in the mental... Where, and in the mental there are containing substances which appropriate and retain ideas. And the mental then acts in conjunction with the loves of the spiritual to produce new effects in the physical realm. And then the physical is is the bottom line or the termination of the whole process. And so in other words, there's a cascading set of generative levels starting from God. God produces the spiritual and the spiritual produces the mental and the mental produces the physical. This is the way I'm trying to framework and I want to see the relation between these things as, as these like generative levels that, that I talked about last week. 
So I that previous slide talked about generation. But as well, there's a selection. The particular spiritual things select which loves from God can be received. So there's generation coming down, but there's selection which, which determines what is received that comes down. Because what's, what comes down must be not only received, it has to be retained, like, and then it has to be used when, it, when the, the action occurs. And so there's a whole lot of constraints needed to make this whole system operate properly. The particular existing mental substances select which ideas can be further produced in the mind. And the particular physical things select which further physical things can be produced and have permanent physical effects. And so it's not a free-for-all to have God and spiritual and mental and physical because there's, there's relations going in both directions. They're not the same kind of relations. The generation from the top is different from the selection, but both of them are necessary. And, and the reason that there are this generation is that God is life itself and has to produce and, and manage all of these things in the world. And the reason there is selection is that God wants the final effects to, to appear, the final delights to, be appear, to, to appear to be our delights. And so there's a reason for this dual structure, links coming down and selection coming up. So this is the sort of the basic structure that we have here. And now we come to the interesting part, at least from my point of view, because I want to say God is equally present in all subparts. God is the same everywhere, all scales, at all scales of space, and at all degrees, levels, and stages of generation. So everything that exists, God appears as this threefold structure of love, wisdom, and power for action. So that means that the same pattern of the same threefold pattern can be applied to each of those three generative levels. The spiritual and the mental and the physical have sub-levels in themselves because each individually sort of is in the face of God and God appears as, as that, that triple structure, this Trinitarian structure, as I put it. So this makes life a little bit complicated, a little bit interesting. Because then these three levels that we talked about, spiritual, mental, and physical, have each of them three sub-levels. So there are nine levels altogether, at least at this stage. And the Greek word for nine is an ennead, a ninefold set of levels. So across the top here in dark, are the, spirit, are the three things we had before. We have a spiritual degree, which has love. We have a mental degree of thoughts. And then a physical degree of actions in the body. But if each of those has a, has a substructure, then you can talk about what the love is loving in this first, in the first degree. It can be, the love can be love of actions, or it can be love of thoughts, or love of love itself. Or love of loving, I should say. Love itself is God. So there's a, there are sub-degrees in the spiritual degree or the level. Similarly, the thoughts in the mind can be thoughts of different kinds of things. You can be thinking about actions. If you're a, if you're a child or interested in doing things all the time, you might be thinking about actions, but you're not thinking about thoughts so much. Thinking about thoughts and thinking about logical structures and theories and everything is in the middle here, thought of thoughts. And then we hope, as we get older, we think more, not just about actions and thoughts, but we think about love. So that the growth of the mind from child to adult is to go up through these three middle stages. And on the right, we have sub-degrees in the physical. And I've just written them in a simple way here. So th this slide is trying to say, show how you produce the sub-degrees of, of the three or original degrees which are across the top. And shortly I'll show 
um, another way of thinking about these which should be familiar to those that have read Swedenborg. But the, I want to remind you that each of these subdegrees describes a substance of its own kind and, and a substance in its own space because it has a capacity to interact with others of its own kind as well as the generation and selection interactions. And within each of those spaces, within the, so there are nine spaces there, and there can be contact within two objects of, of the same kind. And each of the nine spaces exists simultaneously and can interpenetrate without collision. So... The, well... I, th I think of it as going down here, and then down there, and down there. But it's, there are links across the top. Well, it gets interesting. I mean, I haven't explained in detail the relations between all of these, these nine levels, because... So this, this slide is the ENEAD, the ninefold set of sublevels, and I've said form. In other words, this is the logical structure of, this, of these nine levels. But the next slide gives us content for these nine levels in what might be more familiar terms. And as I said, the middle three levels are like children, a, a new baby starts off with an exterior mind, and as they get to about 12 or whatever, teenagers, they're interested in more rational and scientific activities, and then as you become more interested in understanding yourselves and understanding religion, you become more interested in, in, in an anterior rational view of things in which you focus on the particular loves that you have and not just on the thoughts that you have. So these three middle ones are interior rational, scientific rational, and exterior mind. These are names that I've adapted from Swedenborg. Um, Swedenborg, and on the left here we have, I take these to be referred to the heavens that Swedenborg talks about. So if you have a love of actions, that's what Swedenborg calls the spiritual natural heaven. This is where people are interested in having a conscience and want to do the right thing all the time. This is, because Swedenborg talks about three heavens. And it's clear that there are people who, want, who are, want to do the right thing, they want to be helpful and do things, but they, they don't understand a great deal about the reasons for doing things. So and then you next go to the next level, spiritual heaven, which is a deep understanding about the way people think. It's the love of, of thought. So in the spiritual heaven, people are, think about wisdom and they want to understand all the details as much as possible. But at the top... Here we have what Swedenborg calls the celestial heaven, which is the love of loving. So at this point, they don't think so much as they act from affection in, in a more spontaneous way. So I think this threefold structure gives us an important overview of what creation is like. And on the right here, we have physical, actual physical processes. And so... I'm going to, on the slide after this, I'm going to expand this rightmost column some more, just to show that it can be done, because I said everything that there is, God appears to it in a threefold way, so that each of these sub-levels can have sub-sub-levels, unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> so the next... Oh, what have I done here? Yes. So this is it's a little bit difficult to read, but... Here's the three columns. This is the first column of the spiritual. And the, the physical world is this big box. It's been expanded on the right-hand side there. And the, these bottom, the bottom three here of energy, wave function, and actual selection was the, my example from quantum mechanics that I talked about last week. And then th this, these three here, the next one, variational principles, field laws, and virtual events. These are the the level above another three that I mentioned, I showed briefly on the last slide of last week's talk, but I didn't explain in great detail. But what's interesting is that it points to this new degree, which is to do with the reception or the effects of love um, in there, which I think is related 
to gravity, how, how space-time is produced. Or whether, there's room for a lot of speculation in this, and currently physicists are very interested in how gravity is produced, what quantum gravity might look like. And I believe that these people are, in effect, searching for what, how to identify the processes that go on in this sub-degree and its sub-sub-degrees. And so, oh yes. So that yes, this three three this is the actual processes of quantum mechanics, and then virtual processes, and something, some speculative discussion of pre-geometric processes that produce space time. So, what I'm saying here is that these principles of theism that I talked about seemed very simple to start with, but once you allow the fact that everything is an image of God in the whole and in each part, then you can generate a complicated structure well, apparently complicated structure of the world that has, as you, you borrow into each part, it has more details. It's like a fractal, you know, fractals, you go into each subsection and then you expand it and you discover a lot more detail, individual character of detail in each small section. And I think I can identify using ideas from Swedenborg about the heavens, using ideas from developmental psychology to discuss the growth of the mind, and uh, Piaget and Ericsson talk about some sub-sub-degrees in the mind, which I might talk about next week. Okay. So that's the end of the sort of digging, the burrowing down, the, the, uh, the digging deeper into each of these degrees and sub-degrees. And I thought I'd end with just a few general slides to explain some overall features of this way of seeing things. And the, what I want to emphasize is that each of these levels, sub-levels and sub-sub-levels, is a substance. It has a substance. Actually, more precisely, it is a substance and has a form. I should have put it that way. Everything is substance or form, physical, mental, spiritual things. And, and I have this little slogan to myself, no process without structure, no structure without substance. Because a lot of people have ideas that... Um, don't agree with that. And now, and then, furthermore, I want to say, the time is normal. Okay, it's not. It's not. Me there. Are, some people may have read from Swedenborg that there is not time in the spiritual world, but people can misunderstand that. There are still changes, still successive changes, and and in particular, the past is definite. The future doesn't yet exist, maybe as a form, and the present is the sort of the middle between them, the conscious point of becoming. And. And I think many people will recognize that as a sort of a normal way of looking at time. And that, I think, I claim, can be applied to spirituality. Now, I'll just mention that maybe God knows the forms for future things. I mean, this is what pre-omniscience um, of God is. But he doesn't know their substance. He knows their form, but not their substance. Because future substances don't exist. Future substances are still being formed from the being of God. And then I'll talk about correspondences. That's a little bit more detailed, maybe, than I want to go to. I mentioned it briefly last time. But when you have a series of events at one level and a series of events in another, because there are generative links and coming down and there are selection, links, selection acts going up, in order for some pattern to persist for a long time, the we have an alternation of generation and selection which will last the longest, will repeat itself the longest if the patterns of the two levels are most similar. Similar in the sense that they continually produce selection and generation in the right way. So that means that we think of the, the sun, for instance, as a corresponds to love, or love corresponds to energy. So energy behaves in the similar way to what love behaves. I mean, this is the, and Swedenborg discusses a lot of these correspondences. And as I said here, this gives rise to correspondences of function. So what I've done is to try and give a, a causal explanation of why there are correspondences and not just take them for granted. And Swedenborg talks, describes a lot more of these correspondences. But he doesn't so often describe why the particular correspondences exist. But now, 
I've taken on the challenge with this kind of explanation of explaining why um, lungs correspond to wisdom or heart corresponds to love or eyes correspond to understanding. Yeah. Yes? Oops, this one. No, the next one. Do you distinguish between a pair of degrees in the first bullet and adjacent degrees in the fourth bullet? Um, are, are the pairs adjacent? Yes, yes. Same thing, yes, it's the same thing. Right. Yes, Steve? Yes. And then showing how the physical part functions in the Trinity and Aeneid and in the spiritual okay. mind. Mm -hmm. um, is that possible? I mean, well, I'll, 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 how about for next week? Okay. <laughs> I've started, to, I have some idea. And I think we're coming to the end now. There's the question of personal identity. How how you identify a person um, over a long period, including if they survive after bodily death. And because love is the substance of a person, you cannot change a person without changing their loves. Okay? So that means that people resist having their loves changed. This is a general feature. You know, it's my very, everything that I stand for, everything that I want, is what people identify themselves with their loves. They, may, they sometimes may be mistaken, but in general, if they know what they want, then they, they're much more happy with themselves. And so the con continuity of a particular love coincides with the continuity of a person. And, and that means that it's, it's difficult to change loves. I mean, this is what spiritual regeneration is about. It's about how to grow one's loves and to do things in different ways. But it's actually... It's difficult to change loves and keep the same person without the old loves sort of adopting, wanting and adopting the new ones. It's a, it's a tricky process. And that's why one of the reasons why spiritual generation, a spiritual growth is so difficult. You remember from last week when I had these generative levels, the top one was, was fixed. And this applies here. The deepest love can be unchanging. And... And the deepest love of a person can be used to permanently identify that person. This is the way Swedenborg says you can identify people in the spiritual world because they have the same characteristic loves. And Swedenborg also discusses what he calls the inmost degree. Occasionally he mentions an inmost degree, but it's not normally seen, but it's seen by God as the, something permanent which identifies and is unique for each person. So I don't know very much about that. Finally, I will, or well, second to final, I'll talk about law and in intervention because some people think that the, the physical universe has fixed laws and then these laws describe the behavior of physical things. But I say the physical laws describe the behavior of physical things only if there's no influx from the spiritual or mental. Because if there's only physical laws, then matter is what we call causally closed. But in theism, we don't have this causal closure. The world is always being receiving life from God. And so we always have influx, or matter is always receiving power from somewhere. And in fact, if you look into modern explanations of quantum gravity, they continue to see quantum gravity as some kind of dynamical process which generates space and time and generates the coupling constants of the universe. And so therefore, I think physics is also moving towards this view. Because from the, from the, from the theistic point of view, we need this influx in order to sustain physical processes, but also to select and contain all of the mental and spiritual things that are, have generated it. So there's, because the structure that I've been describing has links going up as well as down, both, all levels are needed. 
So from Swedenborg's point of view, you need to live your life on Earth in order to form some physical actions in order to have a permanent life even after you die. This is one of the things that Swedenborg emphasizes that not many other philosophies make clear why that should occur. Most people recognize that it does occur, but they don't see why. And so when you have influx into the physical, this is not intervention, but it's what's intended. It's the intended causal influx. And, and I say, we note how sustained mental and spiritual processes depend on physical selections. And so therefore, life on Earth is necessary. You can't just create beings without having lived in the physical, which um, requires a particular view of what angels are, for example. In other words, the, physics, the physical is a needed bottom line for creation. So I think I'll end there. I'll just li list some of the things that I might talk about next week, okay? And so if you have any things, Steve has an example of a detailed working of a correspondence. Huh? That'd be a good idea. Human body in particular. Yeah. Um, and so my last one was any suggestions. He's already given one suggestion, and then I think we'll end for, for now.